the uh, stroke committee of GTAC. Um, to save time, uh, we've called roll at this point. We don't have a quorum, uh, but we'll proceed as an informational meeting if a quorum, a quorum happens. Um, first up, um, uh, information from the last uh, uh, GTAC Council. Uh, the Brain Attack Coalition Standards for Stroke Ready Hospitals was approved. And that'll now be the basis for acceptable certification for level three stroke cities, level three stroke uh, support facilities throughout the state. Uh, so congratulations. Um, as you guys uh, know, we're the only state that has three levels of stroke certification. Um, and uh, that's gonna prove very valuable when you hear some of the next uh, things that come up. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to give a report uh, from the Texas Council of Cardiovascular Disease and Stroke. Um, but to do that, uh, a better way to do that is to actually uh, have a presentation of uh, the data uh, that's been collected. And so if you can, let's do our, uh, our uh, presentation. Yes. Yeah. So the, these are the Texas Stroke Performance Measures from Rider 97. Uh, you may have seen the abbreviated report, and this is going to be much more detailed. Good afternoon. During the, the 83rd regular, regular le Texas legislative session, funds were appropriated to advance heart attack and stroke reduction efforts throughout the Texas. To inform such efforts, the Texas Department of State and Health Services has launched a heart attack and stroke data collection initiative. The data collection initiative focuses on pre-hospital and hospital data elements. This presentation includes de-identified aggregate data for hospitals who have agreed to share get with the guidelines stroke data with the DSHS. All data are protected under the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. This aggregate data is intended to inform stakeholders about opportunities for collaboration and system enhancement. The objective of data collection is to gain an understanding of the prevalence of heart attack and stroke in Texas, evaluate the pre-hospital components of systems of care, and treatment of heart attack and stroke patients. Findings will be used to assess policies and practices de regarding delivery of care across the state and identify areas of opportunity for quality improvement while recognizing achievement among hospitals. For the purpose of this presentation, I will be discussing the elements of care related to stroke. The data were collected by the Get With The Guidelines Stroke Database by Quintiles. And these data reflect hospital care from October of 2008 to June 2014 from 22 participating hospitals. Data were analyzed for reporting, quality, and achievement measures for effective care for stroke patients. Measures listed on this slide were selected through collaboration with the Rider 97 data consultants. Between 2008 and 2014, 30,046 cases of stroke were reported by participating hospitals. Ischemic stroke, which constituted 67.3% of all the stroke cases, was the most common type of stroke among Texas adults 18 years and older. Other stroke types included transient ischemic attack, which constituted 13.7% of the cases, and intracerebral hemorrhage, which included, consisted of 10.3% of the cases. The mean age of the stroke patients were 67.9 years, and slightly more than half of the patients, or 51.3%, were women. Among the 30,046 cases that occurred, 34% of the patients were transported to the hospital by a private vehicle. 
Brain imaging, or CT scan, is used to identify the type and acuity of a stroke and to locate the blockage or clot. A CT scan should be performed within 25 minutes of hospital arrival and interpreted within 45 minutes of the arrival. Among eligible patients who arrive to the hospital within three hours of last known well or the time at which the patient was last known to be without any signs and symptoms of stroke, 67% did not receive, I'm, I'm sorry, 57, 43% did not receive a CT scan within 25 minutes of arrival. Thrombolytic therapy using intravenous tissue plasminogen activator, IVTPA, is the preferred reperfusion strategy for patients who have had an ischemic stroke where a blood vessel is blocked by a clot. Time to thrombolytic therapy is often referred to as door to needle time. An ischemic stroke patient should receive IVTPA within 60 minutes of arriving at the hospital. Among eligible stroke, ischemic stroke patients, 57.6% of the patients did not receive IVTPA within 60 minutes of arriving at the ED. Ischemic stroke patients who arrive at the hospital within two hours of last known well should be treated within an hour of arrival or three hours of last known well. Among eligible patients who arrived within two hours of last known well, 93.4% were treated within an hour of arrival to the hospital. Patients who arrived within 3.5 hours of last known well should be treated with IVTPA within an hour of arrival or four and a half hours of last known well. Among eligible patients who arrived within three and a half hours of last known well, 39.1% of the patients did not receive a treatment within an hour of arrival to the hospital. Several factors, including severity of the stroke and timely treatment, can affect the health outcomes and recovery of stroke patients, including the stroke survivor's fu functionality in terms of speech, language, and physical ability. In order to achieve the best results, clinicians should consider all stroke patients for rehabilitative services. Among eligible patients, 97.5% of the patients were assessed for rehabilitation services. Approximately half of the patients, or 50.7%, were discharged to home, and approximately a third, or 33.7%, were transferred to other healthcare facility. Among patients transferred to another healthcare facility, more than half, or 59.4%, were discharged to an inpatient rehabilitation facility, and approximately a third, or 33.6%, were transferred to a skilled nursing facility. We have a few additional references, and happy to take any questions. Thank you. It's out, outstanding. Um, how, how, do people believe that it's about one in thir three patients end up going to another hospital facility? Is that about right? It's a lot of people, uh, very expensive. Um, the other things I noted was uh, it looks like CT scanning could be done sooner. Uh, TPA still can be given faster, and that late arrivals had difficulty getting TPA timely uh, manner. Is that what you thought too? Correct. Um, do we have any other questions? So, yes, please. Hi, Wanda Helgeson from Border Rack in El Paso. Did I hear correctly that this is only 22 hospitals? Yes, 22 participating hospitals. And is there um, a region of the state where that, those are accumulated? I mean, are they mainly big metropolitan areas? Are they spread all over? Is it rural? Is it East Texas? Is it West Texas, North, South? I mean, do we, 
sort of know where they are? Right, we haven't mapped those, but they are set throughout the state. And these are the ones who have agreed to share the data, and as um, time progresses, we are expecting more hospitals to be raising so They're not of a particular region. And, and also, I mean, the information has tried to be de-identified, yes. so that any regional analysis that's done, you have to have like five hospitals or something, so that it can't be easily seen or or some number like that. So obviously we need more uh, participating Participation. Um, hospitals. Right, that is correct. So uh, outstanding, I mean this is Rider 97 money, this is uh, the information that people need feedback on for improvement and um, uh, much better than I could have presented, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have quorum now, which is wonderful. Uh, uh, let me give you guys a quick uh, legislative update. Um, we're in session right now, and uh, things are just starting uh, soon. Uh, if we want uh, more money for stroke care, uh, everyone will have to lobby. The place that you want to focus your attention is basically on the House Appropriations Committee. Uh, most likely you'll see a rider appear there. The council is uh, championing for a rider right now, as well as uh, putting forth the information that we've collected from Rider 97, showing the disease incidence in the state and gap analysis, where there's a lower uh, EMS traffic per capita for things like STEMI and heart disease. So um, I hope all of you uh, participate. Um, that's the only way that it's going to work. Um, next up, uh, Felina, we're going to do our education uh, work group uh, update. Um, I'm scheduled to meet with the uh, education committee in the morning and uh, medical directors tomorrow. I think it's after lunch. And uh, they have some questions and some, I think, recommendations, and hopefully we're, we're going to try to to aim for the May meeting to have some finalization of it. Any questions? <laughs> there, <laughs> there could be a lot. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go over what our recommendation was and just to remind people? Um, sure. The, the, our recommendation was that uh, some required uh, continuing education uh, for the EMS folks be set in place. Right now we have nothing that uh, is stroke specific or uh, that we think is kind of keeping us up with what's going on, um, especially after the uh, international stroke meeting uh, and some of the abstracts that came out. There's a lot of research being done that's indicating um, that one particular re uh, study, the, the, uh, they interviewed paramedics and asked them what, what would help you do better and they said education. We, we're just not up where we need to be. So, uh, you know, Texas is, uh, I'd I put our medics up against anybody's. And um, I think that we've got to stay focused and stay aggressive and uh, adding a few hours of that. And it's not additional hours of requirement. It's taking some that exist within the current system that uh, are areas that we can take uh, extra or whatever we want to that's approved. It's taking a couple of those hours and moving them over to a required side um, that would affect all the levels of EMS from our basic first responder groups all the way up through the paramedics. So. And, and actually, this ends up being a very timely time to do that in that um, we're looking at a paradigm shift in care. And um, yes. as is my privilege, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, jump uh, and have a presentation by Paul Hansen on the new studies uh, in this regard because then it'll make more sense in talking about transport plans and stuff. And so, um, Paul, for you. Paul's a neurointerventionalist and he's going to update us on um, uh, Mr. Clean, um, uh, which is unbelievably exciting. It's uh, really a paradigm shift that uh, 
Texas is, uh, I think, better ready to handle than uh, any other state in the United States. So, Paul, please. Yeah, thanks for having me here today. Um, again, my name is Paul Hansen. I'm a physician up in the DFW area. Uh, just a tiny bit of background on me before I jump into this. Uh, I went to Duke University, so I've got my Duke blue on today. Um, play UNC. There's out of an interest of bipartisanship, I've got a little bit of baby blue in my time, for sure. So hopefully uh, that comes across. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about some of the, the new studies that have just come out. Uh, the most exciting one by far is, is MR Clean and uh, talk a little bit about what, uh, what I do personally and what we do as a group up in DFW to, to really uh, uh, provide the optimum stroke care. Uh, and I, I think there are going to be some big changes coming down the pipe. Um, so just very, very basic, starting at the beginning. When we're talking about a stroke, what are we talking about? We're talking about a blood clot in the brain, OK? Um, there are bleeding types of strokes. That's about 15% of what we see. But what we're going to focus on today is a blockage in the brain, just like a blockage in the heart causing a heart attack. Think of a blockage in a brain blood vessel causing a brain attack. Uh, strokes, the fourth leading cause of death. It's actually fallen down a little bit, which that's a good thing. That means we're doing our jobs. Uh, but it's still the number one cause of serious long-term disability. Okay. Um, the numbers of strokes go up, and your chance of having a stroke increases tenfold um, every, or sorry, doubles every time you gain 10 years, so doubles every decade after 55. We're talking about huge amounts of money. Um, the direct and indirect cost of strokes, and this is 2009, so it's a little outdated, but we're looking at 70 billion with a B dollars uh, that are spent on stroke care and the effects of uh, af after a stroke taking care of these patients lifelong. Uh, each stroke is, is estimated to cost uh, at least $150,000. And that's all coming out of uh, taxpayers, private insurance, those sorts of things. So let's talk briefly about the evolution of stroke care. So before 1995, uh, we gave a patient an aspirin. Some docs would give heparin. Some would give Coumadin. Uh, there was really no focused way of doing this. We gave him a handshake, and we said, good luck to you. Uh, then we focused on rehab and see how things went. The focus before 1995 was really secondary prevention. If you had that first stroke, what we're trying to do is prevent that second one. In 1995, there was a landmark um, study that came out, um, National Institute of Neurological Diseases and Stroke, uh, which really set the stage for TPA. So TPA is an industrial strength blood thinning type medication. Um, there's very strict uh, rules about whether you can and cannot use it. Uh, but that was the first acute stroke treatment that really came out. In 2008, ECAS expanded that from a three hour window to a four and a half hour window. It's FDA, well, it's not FDA approved, but it's commonly adopted. Um, it's approved in Europe. Uh, and then during that time frame, uh, intervention kind of started in its in, uh, infancy. So going in and physically pulling out clot. There's often a lot of heated debate about whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, and there were people really staunchly positioned on both sides. Um, TPA was seen as the gold standard. We didn't think it was going to get any better than that. It was IV administrated. Um, it was quick. As soon as the patient came in, you, as long as they uh, had a head CT that, that didn't show any bleeding, uh, you could go ahead and, and uh, as long as they fit this narrow um, time window and, and narrow set of standards, they could get TPA. What we found out is only about 8% of patients that were coming in with strokes were getting TPA. Uh, that was the only people that really qualified. Um, and then what we further found out is that TPA only works uh, to reperfuse large vessels about 13 to 50% of the time, depending on the study that you read. 30 to 40, 35 to 40% of strokes are large vessel strokes. So we know that TPA doesn't work exceedingly well in those cases. When we're talking about large vessels, we're talking about the internal carotid artery, middle cerebral artery, or the vertebral basilar system. Um, prognosis in those strokes is really, really poor. Uh, MCA strokes, 27% mortality rate. ICA strokes, it's almost 50%. It's 50 basilar artery strokes, you're getting up to uh, 90%. I mean, that's a, that's a fatal disease. Um, what we see here is that depending on the length of the, the clot, the length of the clot burden that's embedded in that vessel uh, affects whether or not TPA works. 
what you see is there's a very steep portion of that curve. As you get between four and seven millimeters of clot, uh, the ability of TPA to clear that falls off quite drastically. So what can we do about those situations? And that's where we get into these new stroke trials that have been coming out. So it's very exciting times. We've got uh, some, some huge changes. Uh, the ISC, the International Stroke Conference, met last week uh, in Nashville. Over the last 10 years, there have been many stroke therapy trials where we're looking at, you know, does intervention help? Does it work? Uh, and, and all the answers there were, well, it doesn't really hurt, but it doesn't really help. So why would you do an intervention on somebody when you can't prove that it's really going to help them? IMS3, MR Rescue, uh, Synthesis Expansion, all of those studies basically came to that conclusion that uh, intervention did not hurt, but it ne didn't necessarily help. So last week we have four separate trials that came out that, that came down exceedingly heavily on the side of pro-intervention. And there's a couple reasons why. Um, these are the new options that we have for stroke therapy. Uh, you know, the old way is that medical management or if somebody comes out of the window and doesn't, doesn't receive any sort of interventional care. Uh, IV TPA has long been seen as the gold standard, but now we have bridging therapy where somebody gets IV TPA, but then they can also go and uh, have that clot physically removed. So why are we seeing this now? Patient selection, okay, we, we're coming up with much better ways of selecting which patients we're going to treat. Um, the studies that were done now ensured that the patients that we're studying actually have the disease process that we're talking about. The older studies, they did not do a CTA, they didn't do any advanced uh, intravascular imaging to know whether or not the patients that were included in the trials even had a large vessel occlusion. And that's why some of those numbers look a little different. Device maturity, we've been through several iterations of the devices that we're using now. So we've gone from the Mercy device, which has had, uh, it's, it looked like a hook, it looked like a corkscrew, it looked like a corkscrew with little fibers coming off of it, all sorts of things. It had a high rate of bleeding and a low rate of revascularizing blood vessels. Um, now we're using stent trevers and thromboaspiration and we're getting upwards of 80% of blood vessels to open up. In the old days, we were lucky to get 20 to 30%. Evolution of technique. So, you know, with aspiration, whether it's direct aspiration or thromboaspiration using a penumbra device, um, we have reduced the uh, amount of distal emboli into new territories, um, and we have greatly improved the time um, of groin puncture uh, just through installing protocols and, and making sure that we know exactly what to do with each of these patients. So this is kind of a cheater slide. This is going through the, the two of the, the more famous older studies, IMS3 and MR Rescue. As you see, uh, there is no imaging required to confirm that there is an occlusion prior to enrolling them in the study. So there are a lot of patients in these studies that didn't actually have large vessel occlusions. And that uh, skewed the results towards uh, medical treatment and away from intervention because an intervention is not going to be successful if you don't actually have that, uh, that disease that we're talking about. If we look at the newer studies, they all require uh, advanced imaging ahead of time in order to ensure that they have a large vessel occlusion, and then there's additional imaging to ensure that there isn't so much stroke damage already um, that regardless of intervention or not, that they're not going to do well. So let's segue from that into MR Clean. So this is, this is the big study. This is the one that everybody got excited about. In fact, when this came out, some other studies were, were halted prematurely. Um, because the, the numbers in this study were so favorable for intervention. So the acronym is, is a little unclear. Um, it's kind of word soup when they come up with these, but it's a multicenter randomized clinical trial of endovascular treatment for acute ischemic stroke, and it was done in the Netherlands. Um, the reason that it was able to be done there and the reason that they were so successful is that every single hospital in the entire country used this same protocol. They could not do intervention unless they were doing it as part of this study. So they had 100% coverage uh, over, their, over the entire country. So multi-center, all 16 centers in the Netherlands. It was prospective, randomized, and uh, open-label treatment. So what that means is um, they one-to-one -one divided patients, um, again, across the entire country, collecting every single patient that came in, uh, randomized patients into either TPA or TPA and intervention. And they followed these patients throughout their stay. Uh, the inclusion criteria, uh, 
is, is an acute ischemic stroke, age greater than or equal to 18, and I had stroke scale greater than or equal to two. Um, I'm not sure that I would do an intervention in an NIH stroke scale of two, but that's the way this study was done. Um, they had to prove that there was a, a large vessel occlusion. They had to prove that in the anterior circulations, so we're talking about carotids, uh, internal carotids, MCAs, ACAs, that there was a large vessel occlusion that could be confirmed by CTA, and that uh, TPA could be given or they are presented within a six-hour time frame in order for uh, intraarterial thrombectomy. This is just a little uh, uh, decision tree showing how these patients were uh, split into these two groups. Again, my, my goal isn't to teach you the ins and outs of this entire study and, and these other studies. I just want you to see that these were good studies, that they were well done, and really have a true appreciation of, of how heavily they come down in favor of uh, uh, endovascular treatment. Um, the, the numbers are, are pretty surprising. So. Again, baseline characteristics, the two groups are very similar. Uh, age was even uh, predominantly men, just the way it worked out in this study. Some of the other studies you'll see is more even, and then there's one that's actually heavily weighted towards women. And I stroke scale was nearly the same, 17 and 18 in each group. Um, TPA rates were very similar in both groups. Um, they, were, they were very similar groups. This is just showing the distribution of, of uh, occlusions. Uh, so you can see, again, these are pretty well matched across the interventional arm and the medical treatment arm uh, between ICA terminus, so an ICAT occlusion at the top of the ICA where it branches into the ACA and MCA, M1 occlusions, M2 occlusions, and ACA occlusions. Uh, this is just going over the timing. Again, the, the important thing isn't the numbers. The important thing is these match. So the IVTPA group and the intervention group were on very similar uh, time frames, you know, difference of a minute or two here and there, uh, just showing that they got the same treatment except for the intervention. So we're really looking at what is the difference between a, a pure intervention versus doing TPA itself. If you look at that bottom line, you're, you're looking at time from onset to groin puncture. That's about four hours. So if somebody has a stroke, they get to the hospital in two hours, it's taking two more hours to get them into the, inter you know, to give them TPA, get them into the interventional suite, and uh, start your procedure. Predominantly stent retrievers were used, or stent retrievers were used. Um, this is probably the, the predominant device that's being used these days. Um, basically, it's a stent on a stick. You put it up there, you let it expand into the clot, you wait a few minutes, which end up being the longest minutes of your life, just waiting for that stent to just hang out there. Uh, and then you pull the whole thing out under aspiration to try to make sure that you don't have any distal emboli. Um, so 97% uh, of these cases were done with those retrievable stents. That 2% uh, was a, were a couple other devices. Somebody actually used a Mercy device, which is, is kind of a uh, historical footnote at this point. Um, there was one thrombectomy using aspiration uh, and one where they just macerated the clot with a wire. So here we're looking at TIKI scores, and what's, what that tells us is how open is the vessel. Zero to one, basically you had an unsuccessful uh, therapy. The, the vessel is as closed as it was when you started. 2A means that there's incomplete filling of the vessel that you're trying to open, okay? So we consider a good therapy, a positive outcome, uh, TIKI 2B, which is the vessel's completely open, but there maybe is a little bit of filling delay, and TIKI 3, which is couldn't even tell that there was a clot there, it's completely open. So 2B and 3 are the magic numbers. Uh, that's considered success. Anything less than that is, is a failure. Uh, what we found is that in intervention, uh, it's seven times more likely to recanalize. So we're, we're more likely to open up that vessel, get blood into the, the distal territories, and, and theoretically rescue that tissue and decrease the size of the stroke. Now here's this image I want you guys to kind of burn into your minds. Um, you're going to see something that looks very similar to this multiple times today. What this is is a, a distribution of modified Rankin scores. I'll go into what that means here in just a second. But the, the magic number is two. So if you have an MRS of two or less, that's considered a great outcome from a, from a stroke standpoint. Um, so here we've got 33% uh, uh, on, on the intervention arm uh, versus 19% on the control arm. So that's a, a pretty significant difference. 
what we're talking about with the modified Rankin scale, zero, no symptoms at all. They're essentially at their baseline. One, uh, insignificant disability. So things like a facial droop, things like numbness, things like that where it doesn't impact your ability to, to do your everyday uh, living. So MRS of two, there's the magic number, slight disability. You maybe can't do quite everything that you did before, but you're functionally independent. You can walk on your own and you can do everything that you need to to live your life. So that is that line that we use. So between a two and a three is a big difference. Two and under, you're independent. So we're talking about taking huge chunks of money out of those uh, expenditures that we were talking about earlier. So here's what we saw in MR Clean uh, intervention group. 33% um, were MRS of two or better, so a, a full third. One in three were independent after having a stroke. Uh, the control group, so TPA alone, and again, TPA is the gold standard. We know that TPA works. TPA, 19% independent after having their stroke. So that's one in five. So we're taking a disease process where you have a one in five chance of, of being functional and changing it to a one in three chance. And those are pretty good odds. Here I'm just showing that there's no big difference between the adverse uh, events uh, in the intervention group versus the control group, which is the TPA alone group. Uh, there's one area with an asterisk, and that is this, that when you do these procedures, when you're pulling out that clot, there's always a possibility that a little bit of clot product breaks off and goes downstream. Uh, if that happens, you can have a new stroke in a different area. So we call those dents, which is distal emboli in a new territory. We always want to try to avoid that, minimize that, um, but it is something that will occasionally happen during an intervention. The idea is, is that new stroke in that different territory is going to be much smaller uh, and less uh, disabling than the large stroke that they were going to have. So what does MR Clean tell us? Uh, in patients with acute ischemic stroke caused by a proximal intracranial arterial occlusion, so that's a lot of words saying if there's a blood clot in the ICA or the MCA, um, that intraarterial treatment administered within six hours after stroke onset was, and this is the important part, effective and safe. Um, this study was really uh, designed to show those two things. Uh, it's not showing that it's better than TPA alone, and I always have to stress that, and I get calls from ER docs quite a bit um, saying that the patient doesn't want TPA, they just want to go to thrombectomy. It doesn't work like that. This is, a, this is an and therapy. So you give them TPA and you take them to thrombectomy. It's not one or the other. This isn't a, a replacement for TPA. It's, a, it's an adjunct to it. Um, and what they found is the treatment leads to a clinically significant increase in the functional independence in, in daily life at three months. So this modified Rankin score that we're talking about, um, they're measuring that at 90 days. So three months after the patient presents. So there have been some critiques. Um, you know, the, the, the natural history uh, in, in these patients is worse than in previous trials, especially uh, as compared to IMS-3. Again, I, I talked about that a little bit earlier, is that in this trial they made sure that every single patient in the trial had a large vessel occlusion. Those patients are going to do worse. And in fact, the MR clean data lines up pretty well with the first trial and with some other trials uh, that shows that the, the natural history of these large vessel occlusions is, is, not, is not great. Um, there's some concern that there's a higher number of carotid T occlusions, uh, and while that is true in this study as compared to some of the other studies, uh, the number of carotid T occlusions are the same in the interventional arm and in the uh, medical therapy arm, the control arm. So that doesn't really skew the data. So let's move to another study that came out just this last week. This one's called SWIFT Prime. So solitaire with intention for thrombectomy as primary endovascular treatment uh, for ischemic stroke. So in other words, salad. I think they come up with the names first, and then they try to get things to fit. Um, again, randomized trial comparing IVTPA uh, plus, or IVTPA plus intervention. In this case, they used the solitaire device uh, versus IVTPA alone. Again, one-to-one -one randomization. They have the same number in each group. And this was done in 39 sites in the U.S. and Europe and was run by Dr. Saver. Um, inclusion criteria, of course, they had to have had a stroke. Um, again, the age cutoff is about the same, 18 to 80. Uh, Pre-stroke MRS, so what you're doing is you're making sure that the patients that you're treating already have a pretty decent baseline. Uh, we're not talking about uh, nursing home patients or patients that, excuse me, have had large strokes in the past um, and, and don't look good at baseline. 
aspect score. What that is is a, a CT-based uh, rubric for evaluating how much stroke has already occurred. Um, aspects less than six, I can tell you, would be a pretty big stroke already, and that's not somebody that would go to the angiography suite. Uh, in fact, the cutoff is usually seven. Uh, but that's just making sure that the patients that have come in don't already have huge strokes, okay? These are patients that, as you'll see, have an aspect score of nine, which means that essentially there are no changes on their CT scan when they first hit the door, which means that the stroke that they're having is relatively new, relatively fresh. They want to make sure that they give TPA to all their patients uh, within the, the guidelines. And again, they're making sure that these patients actually have the disease that we're talking about, which is a large vessel occlusion. Uh, and again, they're trying to do these procedures within six hours. And, and you're going to see that six-hour time frame is pretty important. That's what we're seeing in most of these studies. Uh, again, I'm, you know, these are just here to show you that it was a good study. The two, the two arms were very evenly matched. There's not a significant difference uh, between any of these groups that, that, um, that uh, pricked the ears of the uh, statisticians. We'll just skip over some of these because, you know, I've included it so that if you get a copy of the, um, the presentation, all this data is in there. But, you know, going over the exact numbers isn't necessarily the important part. Again, this is just showing that the time frame uh, is very similar in both groups, um, that getting TPA being randomized and moving forward didn't take any more time than getting TPA being randomized and moving forward to intervention. So here's another one of those important slides. So successful reperfusion, how often did the blood vessels actually open up? You can see that it's two to one in favor of intervention. So this is showing that intervention works, it does open the blood vessels. And now the question is, does that translate to better outcomes? And here, again, you see this, this MRS, the modified and Rankin scale diagram. Very similar skew pattern as before. Um, you know, in MR clean, it was about, uh, there was about a one-third difference. Here there's closer to a 50% difference in the two groups. So if we're looking at the modified Rankin scale of zero to two, again, that's, our, that's where we consider it a success. The interventional group was at 60%, the control group was at 35.5%, so almost a two-fold uh, difference. So what did we learn from Swift Prime? So in acute ischemic stroke patients with confirmed large vessel anterior circulation occlusion, so again, we know that they have a large vessel occlusion causing their stroke, in patients that were treated with TPA and then rapidly uh, moved on to the angio suite, they've had less post-stroke disability uh, over the entire outcome range, and it increases the proportion of patients who are alive and independent at three months after stroke. Um, the take home here is that for every two and a half patients treated, one more patient has a better disability outcome, and for every four patients treated, one more patient is independent at long-term follow-up. Again, that's the importance of that uh, modified ranking scale of two or less. Yet another study. So again, we're starting to mount some evidence here. Uh, SCAPE, which was done by Dr. Michael Hill uh, in Calgary. So this is a Canadian study. Um, endovascular treatment for small core anterior circulation proximal occlusion with emphasis on minimizing CT to recanalization time. So still, it's a lot easier to say ESCAPE. Um, standard care versus standard care plus rapid thrombectomy. This was a trial uh, looking on ways to improve the time to treat. So improving getting these patients to the angiography suite quickly and was really to look at um, how patients did based on how quickly they could get to them. Again, we're looking at the modified Rankin score at 90 days. That's going to be the same in each one of these studies. Inclusion criteria, again, very similar to the other ones, except in here they've uh, discounted patients that have poor uh, collateral circulation. So if you looked at their uh, their vascular imaging, and they really didn't have any filling of collaterals on that side, they dismissed the patients from this study. Again, the, the patients are very similar in both groups. Um, age, the same. This one was uh, slightly predominant women. It was done in Canada, so it's mostly Caucasians. Uh, baseline NI stroke scale, very similar uh, in both, so 16, 17. Um, all the comorbidities are very similar. So there again, I'm just trying to convince you that this is a well done study. 90-day uh, modified Rankin scale. Again, we're seeing that same skew pattern. It's almost a two-fold uh, difference between the interventional arm and the control arm. And again, we're looking at that modified Rankin scale of two or less. 
what we see at the safety endpoints is that you know uh, half uh, the rate of mortality, um, a smaller number of uh, malignant or large MCA strokes. Uh, the number of bleeds is about the same. And then, of course, with an intervention, there's going to be a couple things unique to intervention, which are um, blood vessel perforations or access site hematomas. And again, those were, were very, very rare complications. So what does escape tell us? So that endovascular thrombectomy is a safe, highly effective procedure that saves lives and dramatically reduces disability when, so again, we're getting back to patient selection, so carefully selecting patients um, based on preliminary imaging to look at their blood vessels and, and excluding patients that already have large strokes. Um, and then again, being aggressive with the time frame. So trying to get patients uh, from imaging to groin puncture in 60 minutes and imaging to reperfusion in less than 90 minutes. And those are, those are pretty um, aggressive time marks, but it is, it is something that we're capable of. And again, it's just showing that this is a safe and effective technology, the, the retrievable sense that we're using. And this is the last one. So this is a fourth study, again, in the same vein as the others, another randomized controlled trial looking at endovascular thrombectomy after either a standard dose IV TPA uh, alone or uh, standard dose TPA and then moving quickly to thrombectomy. This, again, was a study geared towards looking at patient selection. Um, here they used a couple of different uh, imaging modalities in order to, to optimize which patients were selected. They're using the solitaire device again. Uh, and this was a much smaller study. There were only 35 patients in each arm. So there's some, a little bit differences between the, the two groups. Again, we're looking at the inclusion criteria, very similar to the other ones. Uh, you want a patient that at baseline is pretty healthy, greater than age 18. Uh, and again, you're, you're making sure that they actually have the disease process that we're talking about, that they have a large vessel occlusion. So again, we can go through all these images, but um, the, the, the groups are pretty similar. Um, there's a little higher rate of diabetes in the control group in this one, um, but otherwise similar. The results are the same, uh, sorry. The results were the same, though, if we're looking at the modified Rankin scores. Um, Again, there's a huge predominance of functional patients after thrombectomy versus just IV TPA alone, 71% to 40%. So almost twofold again. Um, number needed to treat 3.2 patients to have just one functional patient, uh, one more functional patient afterwards. This was just looking at, at um, stroke volume growth in that study. So what you can see on the right-hand side is that there was very little growth of the stroke from initial imaging to post-intervention. If you look on the left side in the red column, there's actually a fairly large uh, stroke growth. So basically showing that if you do not open up the vessel, if you don't reperfuse that area, they are going to go on to have a much larger infarct. Um, looking at the safety points, again, very similar in, in both groups. Again, you, you can have that uh, embolic um, phenomena to new areas. So they're talking about distal emboli there at the bottom. And again, that's going to be a risk of the procedure that we're doing. So what do we get from Extend IA? What are the conclusions here? Uh, again, saying that it's a very safe, very effective um, tool that we can improve stroke outcomes. And they even went as far as saying that TPA plus mechanical stent thrombectomy should be the new standard of care. And that's a pretty bold statement. And I believe it's actually going to stand up. Um, we, we have a, a critical mass of studies that are now starting to come out that have been put together in the appropriate way to show that if you select your patients correctly, if you go with patients that have large vessel proximal occlusions, um, and these are all geared towards the anterior circulation, but I think this would hold up for posterior circulation or even be even better for posterior circulation. Uh, that these patients will do quite well, much, much better if you open up the vessel with uh, a thrombectomy device versus just giving them TPA and crossing your fingers. Now again, I'm not saying don't give patients TPA. I want every single patient to get TPA across the board. Every single patient that we can should get TPA. Patient comes into the ER, you can hang TPA very quickly. Getting the interventional team in takes a little bit of time. So while you're waiting for that interventional team to come in, you've got TPA in the system, it's working away. We know that 
20 to, to 40 percent of those clots are going to open up with TPA alone. But what about that huge number of clots that, that don't, that um, 50 to 70 percent? You know, what we're doing is basically buying them time for the interventional team to get in there and, and take that clot out. So let me talk just a little bit about what TSI does um, in, our, in our group that we have up in, in uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, we're an HCA initiative, so basically we cover the HCA hospitals in the North Texas area, and we do interventions in a couple of those uh, sites. We have primary uh, stroke centers that, that really handle uh, a lot of the calls, uh, and then we have two comprehensive sites that act as hubs to our hub and spoke model where we funnel those patients in that meet criteria in order to have them evaluated by us. We're a team of niche neurovascular neurologists. We are on the phone 24-7 um, and we accept patients from across the region. So we get calls from somewhere around 148 different hospitals that physically call in just to talk to the docs that we have on call. Um, and, and really we, we do a lot of education uh, a lot of outreach to the North Texas area in order to really spread the gospel, so to speak, of stroke care. Um, we want patients to come in to the, their nearest hospital. We want them to get TPA, and we want those ER docs to call into our system and ask for advice. Um, the ER docs are the ones physically giving the TPA, but they're doing so with a trained uh, neurointerventionalist or, or neurovascular uh, neurologist on the phone with them. And, and that's a bit of a difference uh, compared to what's commonly done. Um, this is our, our pathway. Uh, it looks kind of busy, but basically if a patient shows up with stroke symptoms, they get basic labs. This is all protocolized um, so that every patient is essentially treated the same. We've got stroke teams, uh, door to needle teams at every single hospital that looks at each hospital's uh, strengths and weaknesses in order to streamline the process for that hospital specifically. Some do imaging faster, some do labs faster. Um, so what you have to do is come up with what's going to be best for that patient in that hospital. So they come in, they get their labs, they get their CT scan. If their CT scan shows a bleed, they may call us or they might call neurosurgery depending on the type of the bleed. If there's no bleed, then they go down the, the three pathways on the left, uh, which is looking at the ischemic strokes. Green pathway for us is less than four and a half hours. Those are TPA eligible. Yellow pathway, four and a half to 12 hours. Those are intervention eligible. Blue pathway, greater than 12 hours. Um, those generally can't get any of these, these newer treatments, uh, but they may still need neurocritical care depending on where the stroke is, how large the stroke is, and if it's posterior circulation, if we're talking about a basilar stroke, it's somebody that we even may, outside of that time window, consider taking to the uh, angiography suite just because, as we looked at that slide before, mortality for a basilar stroke is, can be as high as 90%. Um, so if you do nothing, uh, it's definitely not going to help. To simplify that, stroke less than 12 hours or a hemorrhage, they're calling us. Okay, they're getting one of our docs on the phone. Stroke greater than 12 hours or a TIA with no uh, vascular imaging abnormality, those are going to the general neurologist, and those are patients that oftentimes will stay uh, in their home hospital, but they'll, they'll just talk to us on the phone and, and make sure that, uh, with a little hand-holding, that we're all on the same page and that they can get good care there. Uh, if ever there's a hospital that doesn't feel comfortable with a stroke patient, and it's somebody that doesn't necessarily need intervention, what we do is we kind of broker getting them into our system, uh, but to one of our primary stroke centers. And then if it's trauma, the neurosurgery group or the trauma service gets called. Um, this is basically what we've talked about already, but you know, what are the options for stroke treatment? Again, TPA in four and a half hours or less, uh, and then the possibility for intervention. Now, Somebody who shows up in six, uh, well, in, in three and a half hours gets TPA, they're well within that six hour window uh, for intervention, that doesn't guarantee that they're gonna get an intervention. It just means that they're going to be considered for an intervention. If they have a large vessel occlusion and they get a rapid sequence MRI or, or some advanced imaging, it may show that they already have a huge stroke there. Uh, we can't unstroke brain. So even if uh, we pull that clot out, what we're really going to do is expose that patient to a higher risk, um, that you're going to have a pressure head hitting that, that brain that has already died, and, and they may have a higher bleed risk. So again, with uh, patient selection, we have to make sure that we're offering this treatment to the patients that stand to benefit from it. 
again, what do we do? We're evaluating, do they actually have a disease that we can help them with? We can't do anything about small lacunar strokes. We can't do anything about strokes that are out in M3s, M4s, uh, in those very distal areas. So it has to be a large vessel, proximal stroke. Um, they need to have uh, otherwise healthy brain, um, no large stroke already present. So this is just a picture of our angiography suite that we use. Um, and a, a little cartoon going through what it is that we can offer. So intraarterial TPA isn't really done all that often anymore. That would be getting a catheter up to the side of the clot uh, and just infusing some TPA there. Honestly, if you're going to go through all the trouble of getting up to that spot, uh, at this point in time, you just go ahead and try to take the clot out. You can do that in a couple different ways. One's thromboaspiration, which you can just think about as a, a vacuum to suck the clot out. Uh, the Mercy retrieval device, which still exists, but but really isn't used anymore. Uh, and the stent trievers, of which we have two. There's, uh, uh, in the US anyway, uh, Trevo, which is a striker device, and uh, Solitaire, which is an EV3 device. So what do we look for in a uh, thrombectomy device? Um, ideally, it's gonna open the artery quickly. It's gonna mac maximize the quality of the revascularization. So again, we're looking for that ticky 2B or, or 3, which means that the entire distribution is, is filling. We want to minimize distal emboli into new territories. We want it to be safe and simple to use because the faster we can do it, the better the outcome, and it needs to be cost effective. So this, is, this was provided by Penumbra, and of course their device looks the best on this, uh, but this is just showing that we have had an evolution. These are going from older stroke devices to newer stroke devices that each iteration uh, gets better than the last, and we have a higher percentage of uh, open vessels after the procedure. This is just a picture of a stent retriever, just so you can kind of picture what it is. Again, what you do is you take a microcatheter all the way up to the side of the clot, you cross the clot with a wire, and you take that microcatheter all the way across the clot, and then what you do is you put the, the uh, thrombectomy device up regardless of what type of retrievable stent you're going to use. Um, you get that in place, and rather than pushing the device out, what you actually do is unsheath the device. You pull the, the microcatheter back. The device, it's memory metal, it expands, looks just like a stent, except that it, instead of being deployed and left there, it's deployed, but it's still attached. You give five minutes for that uh, stent to really embed itself in the clot, get a good hold, and then under suction, you pull everything back. Uh, the suction is important to try to reverse blood flow uh, transiently in order to capture any of those distal emboli that may go somewhere else. Uh, but the idea is in one single pass, you can get that clot out. This is what the penumbra system looks like. Uh, again, it's, it's essentially a vacuum tube. This is an older picture. This is using the separator, which we don't really use anymore. The, the newer device um, and the newer technique is called ADAPT, where you essentially just advance the suction catheter all the way up to the clot, turn it on, it starts to suck basically corks the clot in the uh, catheter and you, you pull it back that way. So this is what we're talking about here. Um, what we have is a, a blood vessel that is comes to an abrupt end. So if we, this is the left MCA um, and it, it it's just not there. We see the ICA pretty well, we see the um, we see the ACA pretty well, but that MCA just stops. So if we go here what you can see is on that right hand picture, or left hand if you're a radiologist, what you see is that there's now a new blood vessel there that wasn't there before. Um, and that's the idea. Uh, you give this patient TPA, that TPA may, may work, and if it works, great. Uh, that's the best outcome for the patient because you know, the TPA is gonna get there faster than I ever can. Um, but if the TPA doesn't chew all the way through that clot, we, we have the ability to go up there and pull that clot out and restore blood flow and, and give them a it, they end up with a much smaller stroke and a much better chance of being functional afterwards. This is what we end up finding stuck to the end of our device. Um, and these are the, the, the hospitals that we service directly uh, up in the DFW area. Any questions or anything that you guys want me to go into a little bit more detail on? <laughs> Um, thanks. Um, as you guys might imagine, um, this is uh, the paradigm shift. Um, endovascular care, uh, based on these studies, is now level one evidence, and uh, standard of care is what uh, was uh, proposed at the International Stroke Conference. 
What this means is if endovascular care is the level one standard of care, you have to have a, um, a tiered, triaged um, stroke care system in the state. Uh, again, Texas is the only state with three level tier triage, um, trying to take people to the highest level of uh, care. Uh, the level threes are drip and ships, and level uh, twos are the TPA sites, which can then also ship or transport, and then the level ones are where the endovascular care is. So um, this now becomes critically important um, how do we know when to um, take people to which site? Um, previously, the recommendation uh, of this committee um, and um, the legislation was uh, take to the highest uh, level of uh, service uh, with no more than a 15-minute delay. Now, that's a recommendation. Different RACs do that differently. But now, this, this data suggests that if you have a large vessel occlusion, you're more than twice as likely to recover with endovascular care. So that means, in my mind, that you either need a CTA, some imaging, or you need a methodology uh, to do a triaged uh, transport. And um, um, because of limited time, um, I'm going to thank Paul, uh, but we're going to move on to our uh, committee uh, with uh, Dr. Kravins on uh, uh, options for transport bypass and what things we can do to now fulfill what uh, Paul has shown us is now the new standard. So thank you. thanks. Um. I think I'm going to reiterate what you just said. Uh, there's been a huge shift uh, in what now is going to com be considered not just the standard, but is necessary for the state to look at. Uh, it, not only last week at the International uh, Stroke Conference, but at, the, in, at our conference, the uh, neurosurgery, cerebral vascular, combined with the interventionalist, this is landmark stuff. And, and we, just, we just made the jump from might help, could help, we gotta look at it to, it's pretty much a done deal. Now it's figuring out how to integrate, as Dr. Rutledge just said, the three tiers of you get your lab done, you get your diagnostic stuff evaluated, and you work at looking and triaging for those patients that need to go to a comprehensive stroke center, period, the end. Now, how do we do that with a 22 region <laughs> rack system? Uh, our last meeting, uh, we were still going through and looking at the different criteria that different areas used. Uh, th in, in a way, this is, this is really exciting, and at the same time, it totally shifts, I think, the responsibility of how we need to look at doing this. So um, what I would ask for is literally, uh, you know, if it's all 22 rack systems involved, whatever needs to be done to get this expedited, uh, Texas needs to take the lead in getting that accomplished. So. I need some. I need some feedback from the, some help from the rack. So, I guess one of the questions is going to be, you know, and this ties in with the education as well, is, um, you know, what are we going to use for first responders? Um, because that can save time. Are we going to use something like lambs, or um, another uh, uh, another methodology to? Uh, uh, help uh, expedite or transfer these patients. And so my assumption would be your ask is, because you're tasked with trying to put together a transport plan, is to ask for help from the RACs. Um, Houston obviously has uh, done a very good job of trying to do a triage response, uh, but um, I, I imagine this is gonna change. Uh, I mean, they also have a CT and an ambulance. 
They don't have a cath lab in an ambulance yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> Houston may lead the way. Um, and what about so, those areas that don't have access to um, the neuro? Yeah, neurointerventionalist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do we? Yeah, air air medical. Uh, tra those transports as well. Go ahead. But but I think the point here is that, uh, that as you said, the algorithm has shifted now in the sense that. Before, it was get them to the first place they can start treatment. If you can't get them to a comprehensive place, here, what are your options and how do you triage that? You're talking a four to six hour window after you start TPA. And there's pretty much very few places you can't get your initial lab done, get them to some place to get a CT done, to get that initial workup done. So our whole system is fixing to take a major shift. And, and I think it's, the, the, the challenge is to us to make a recommendation that, that really integrate. I mean, to have four to six hours, it's hard to say, well, I'm in El Paso or I'm out someplace. I can't, I can't get to a comprehensive center. You, you get your lab done, your CT done, that determination is made, that patient is potentially a candidate for clot retrieval. You got four to six hours to get them someplace. There's very few places in the state you can't get them to. So I think this really changes the game. And I mean, I, I'm not trying to be dramatic, but last week this was, <laughs> this was a big thing. <laughs> so I mean, this, this changes everything about strokes. And I, I didn't get to ask, Dr. Hanson, what's the percent of large vessel occlusions in ischemic strokes? Nonetheless, the ischemic, the ischemic strokes are 80% of all of our strokes. That's a huge patient population. And we now have an, uh, uh, the potential to do something to help these folks. So now, now, we, now the onus is on us to really rethink this on, on not just can we get people to the right place in a short period of time, which in Texas is pretty difficult, but now you start people on TPA and you've got four to six hours to look at those patients to consider sending them to a comprehensive stroke center, that's got to be really rethought. So, Yeah, and the, and the thing I would add is if you look at the ESCAPE trial, uh, that was uh, out to 12 hours with good imaging, with perfusion imaging where you didn't have uh, a, a large area of completed stroke or dead brain. So, I mean, amazing, amazing times. I just can't believe it. Landmark. I've got a broken foot, so I might better get up there. Do you Yes, please. So, I, I, I hear, I, I'm not sure it is going to change the way the RAC structure moves around. Um, because a comprehensive stroke center may be farther away than a primary stroke center that actually has intervention treatment, just hasn't gone through certification as comprehensive. So if they're already doing intervention, they just have chosen not to either at this time get comprehensive or they're in pursuit, they're still going to be able to receive and it's still better for the patient than to go the, I mean, if they're, if they're headed that way, that's that whole in pursuit stuff, very much like level one, when we're sending to a level one trauma center. And so that's kind of how we've addressed it in our region, um, is that, I mean, we have a referral pattern for interventional and, um, there are certain cases that we've allotted to go to um, a comprehensive, but you know, flying is it, I mean, I have probably the most helicopters in the entire world, and I have like 12, I think, that service our area. But um, it's not always in the best interest of the patient to fly an extra hour and a half when they could fly 15 minutes for interventional at our primary stroke center. Um, the, our, our, our transport plan through the state is rack centric it is rack centric because there are different conditions in different areas that require different transports and uh, one methodology doesn't work for every single one but I still think what this uh, these landmark studies show is if you have a large vessel occlusion TPA doesn't do it uh, at all and so and and so the the shift that I think we're talking about it's not just level one data 
This is the same paradigm shift as when the NINDS trial happened in 1995. The issue was not so much uh, did you get, you know, uh, uh, sued for giving TPA, you got sued for not giving TPA. And that's the paradigm shift because you're more than twice as likely to improve with stents on a stick. And as, I, as you've seen from some of these other lectures, the ADAPT techniques, these end of it, the next generation of, of systems after that are even better than right, these. I'm agreeing with you. What I'm saying is we keep using the word comprehensive, and I think that endovascular treatment is available at primary stroke centers that have not certified as comprehensive stroke centers. That, that was my intent. It's I'm not sure it's going to be a complete uh, paradigm. I mean, ultimately, for people to go to a primary um, stroke center to start TPA and, and all of that. But the, the issue becomes, do they have interventionalists that are able to do clot retreat? And, and, and we're in, in the past, there may have been debate about that, so that there was a debate about comprehensive versus primary, et cetera. Now, that debate's gone. And, and not only is that gone, the time issue has changed. So it's no longer, you've got to get there in a, in a time frame that's unrealistic in many parts of Texas. That's not the case now. Now the case is they need to be seen, get their initial lab work, their diagnostic studies done, be started on TPA if appropriate, and then look at the studies to determine do they need to go to a comprehensive or primary stroke center if they have interventionists that can do that, that's fine. But that becomes the, the more germane question to be answered. And then for us to come up with a recommendation relative to the rack systems that, that makes that feasible and makes that um, a standard for everyone. So, I mean, I give everybody my um, email address and, and I'll be happy to meet and let's start working on this because we need to make this happen. <laughs> that was a great con yeah it has changed very for three months ago that was a great comment any other uh, comments I mean this is a interesting time uh, a quick comment uh, Dickie Huey from San Antonio some of the misinterpretation has been in the bypass is that the impression is that they should bypass a primary stroke center to go to a comprehensive. And if that's true, then we need some way for EMS to be able to somehow triage. And I don't know that we can do that without um, lots of ambulances with CT scanners, et cetera, in the thing. But, uh, you know, is there a, a different system? I know how, wh what Houston does, they have a tiered and if their scale is a little higher, then they bypass a primary to go to a comprehensive. But I, I, don't, I don't know, that's the impression that um, some of the EMS people have gotten. Yeah, so, so just to remind everyone, the recommended transport plan is to go to the, to transport to the um, highest level of stroke center with more than a with no more than a 15 minute delay that's that's the recommendation now each rack then develops their own transport plan based on their local uh, conditions uh, in regards to how do we determine if someone has a large vessel occlusion the absolute way is to do a CTA or an MRA but uh, in lieu of that, what we may be able to do, and that's what George uh, and his work group is working on, is uh, uh, a stroke scale, NIH stroke scale like over eight, or a LAM score, or a uh, physical exam that uh, suggests a large vessel occlusion may be an alternative way. And I think that's one of the things that Houston has been very successful in uh, showing us as possible. Yep. So in Houston, they're, are they using like the LA stroke scales or is that what they're using? They're, they're using the uh, LAMS motor scale. Is anybody here from Houston? I don't want to misquote what they do. 
Yeah, so they're, so they're using, they're using, and I think what we'll be seeing happening here very quickly is uh, people will uh, be working on new uh, first responder scales of how to differentiate in the field large vessel occlusions from small. But basically, if, if, if you see someone and it's obvious that they have a stroke, they can't move their arm, their leg, they're, they're really out of it, that's a large vessel occlusion. But how, how you uh, uh, make that, you know, the, the fine di differentiations, I mean, that's what George and his work group and, and hopefully you guys will help us with. Other comments, this is cool. Okay, um, so lots of work to go. Um, so in the 18 minutes we have left, I don't like large me long meetings. Uh, one of the things uh, that we put on the agenda just to uh, give a chance for people to discuss is um, uh, we talked about uh, freestanding emergency rooms uh, uh, and could they receive a stroke center designation and within us within the um, rules of the state you have to be attached to a hospital so the answer that we got back was no but there are also freestanding uh, emergency rooms uh, in rural settings that aren't necessarily directly attached to a hospital. And so I wanted to bring it up for discussion, and uh, I'll probably bring it up a couple more times, is should we consider making a special level three or level four designation for these standalone uh, emergency rooms in special rural settings? And does anyone have any comment on that? Nobody works at one. Yeah, but I, I, would, I would caution because we have small rural hospitals that can't become level three stroke that aren't seeking designation because they don't want to do things. They don't want to. It's too much money, and everybody gets different reasons. I don't want to go into that. But if we gave a special um, compensation for freestanding emergency departments, I think the rural. Um, smaller hospitals that are the only medical treatment in a rural county might have something to say on that. And, and uh, excellent point. Um, now also realize that the level three designation, or uh, well actually certification, the level three certification, um, based on our previous meeting and, and uh, GTAC approval, now the certification process is based on the Brain Attack Coalition's Support Stroke Facility uh, Guideline. What that means is uh, I'm hoping that there'll be uh, easier uh, ways for uh, the rural hospitals to get their certification cheaper, easier, and, and still fulfill all the things that we need to make sure that uh, they're getting good care, that people are getting good care. Any other comments on um, standalone, rural standalone ERs? <coughs> no? Okay. Um, another point of discussion, just to come up, because this has come up uh, from several times from several people. <coughs> um, does anyone have any comments on uh, recommendations for adding uptime requirements for stroke center state designation? That is, um, uh, if a stroke certified stroke center is unable to fulfill those requirements for, say, six months out of the year or something like that, right now the state they designate centers, they don't certify centers. So um, if there were issues with the time, how long they were unable to fulfill those criteria, it would then be the certifying body's responsibility to remove certification, and that would then remove state designation. Uh, is there interest or do people have comments? Should the state have 
uh, uptime requirements for their designation. Comments, thoughts? Say again, I couldn't hear you. Yes. Okay, please think about this. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, our job is to try to help people become certified and, and help, you know, uh, do stuff, which, and it's my inclination not to be uh, uh, punitive or not trying to do this, but at the same time, if someone's not providing care, it's not fair for them to say they're designated. Is, is there something, I'm, I'm for my edification, is there something in the certifying entity's time that if a if a center that has been certified and therefore designated, that if they don't fulfill those criteria, they lose that certification? Is there something in their mechanism? Um, yes, um, um, certifying bodies uh, can look at that, and um, if you have concerns with a hospital uh, not fulfilling that, that really needs to go to the certifying agency, which the state can help you with who that is. Um, from a state perspective, we're trying to help people um, uh, stay up. And, you know, if there's ways we can help somebody stay up, I think that's what we do. Uh, but if you're not fulfilling your roles, uh, through uh, your certification, you're required to report that to uh, your EMS providers uh, because it then does affect transport and bypass. Okay. Uh, next, we have review and update the strategic plan for Texas EMS and trauma, and I apologize, I didn't bring that. I think we did it last time. And then uh, identify and list accomplishments of this committee since its inception. We already provided and did that as well. So this is now a uh, general public comment. Uh, do we have any comments from anyone? Hello. Wendy Segrist with American Heart Association and American Stroke Association, and I'm the Vice President of our Quality and Systems Improvement Program. Um, I'm here on behalf of Caitlin Murphy, who's our Government Affairs, uh, Government Relations Director since she's at the Capitol, but wanted to clarify just our priorities and ask the information just be captured and reported in the meeting for some of the people who aren't able to be here today. So the American Heart Association, our organization, did advocate last session for $4.5 million to establish a stroke clinical research network in the state of Texas. We are pleased with the progress of the Lone Star Stroke Research Consortium in setting up the infrastructure and initiating studies. It's important that we continue to fund the stroke research in the state as it's the stroke number four or five killer. And we therefore support the continuing of the funding for the Lone Star Stroke Consortium at that $4.5 million level for the next biennium. And then secondly, that we, as the American Heart Association, actively lobbied last session for the $500,000 that was appropriated for, I think it's currently called the Texas Heart Attack and Stroke Data Collection Initiative, or type of state registry. And we'd like to see these dollars remain in the budget and an increase considered. And while um, the current draft, as I know there's a drafted rider that's, that's updating, um, does impact heart disease and stroke, um, not everything in there yet aligns with the strate strategic priorities at this time. So to that end, we are still focusing on advocating for the Texas Heart Attack and Stroke Data Collection Initiative and would like to see an increase in funding, if at all possible. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Any announcements or meetings? I have an announcement. Oh. 
Um, I just wanted to share that the Southwest affiliate is planning another stroke coordinator conference. Um, they're going to do an, actually an emergency neurological life support in Houston um, on Wednesday, April 29th. And then on Thursday and Friday, it'll be a day and a half um, um, conference, and it's called Your Role as Stroke Coordinator from Surviving and Th to Thriving. And it was actually an excellent conference that was um, done a year ago or so in Denver. So just so you know, to um, watch for information about that. Great, thanks. Uh, anyone else, any comments? If not, we stand adjourned. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>